Now, The Good Fight with Yasha Monk. Hi, this is Christina Hoff Summers. I'm a former philosophy professor and now a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. I recently wrote an article for Persuasion called Lessons of a Black Pioneer. The article is about the day Shirley Chisholm visited George Wallace in the hospital. Now, Shirley Chisholm was a political progressive. She was the first black woman to serve in the US Congress. George Wallace was the governor of Alabama and a notorious segregationist. Now, at the time she visited him in the hospital, they were rivals in the 1972 presidential primary. And Wallace had just been shot five times at point blank range by an assassin. And he would remain paralyzed and pain ridden for the rest of his life. Wallace was stunned by her visit. And he said, Shirley Chisholm, what are you doing here? (laughs) He knew that he was her nemesis and that her supporters would be angered by the fact that she visited him. But her answer brought him to tears. And she just looked at him and said, I don't want what happened to you to happen to anyone. Well, they chatted, they prayed together. And when she left, George Wallace did not want to let go of her hand. George Wallace's daughter, Peggy Wallace Kennedy, has described Chisholm's visit as life-altering for her father. She said Shirley Chisholm had the courage to believe that even George Wallace could change. And many people don't know this, but Wallace did change. He became Chisholm's ally and helped her pass some legislation. He eventually publicly renounced racism and sought forgiveness from black parishioners and civil rights leaders. In 1979, his daughter tells a story that he arrived in his wheelchair at a black church in Montgomery, Alabama, and he confessed to everyone present about all the harm and misery he had caused, and he begged their forgiveness. And as he left the sanctuary, the congregation rose and sang Amazing Grace. Now, there are skeptics who will say that Wallace's apology tour was just a ploy to advance his political career. But there are many witnesses who say otherwise, including the civil rights leader, John Lewis. He's written that, quote, I could tell that he was a changed man. He says that Wallace acknowledged his bigotry assumed responsibility for all the harm he had caused, and he wanted to be forgiven. Well, Lewis forgave him. And so did Black voters in Alabama. Wallace carried more than 90% of the Black vote in his final gubernatorial campaign in 1982. Now, it's not easy to classify Chisholm politically. She was a passionate activist who called herself a revolutionary. But in elective politics, she considered compromise the highest of all arts. She had a talent for forging unlikely alliances. She was in fact well-known, legendary for this. When she had to choose between endorsing the feminist progressive Bella Abzug or the more conservative Daniel Moynihan in their race for the Senate, she went with Moynihan, whom she called a fighter with a brilliant mind. Well, that's a good description of Chisholm herself, a fighter with a brilliant mind. This fighter, she knew all about systemic racism and intersectional oppression, but experience taught her that bigotry and chauvinism were just not the province of any race or gender. They were human vices. Her answer to racism wasn't more racism, it was humanism. The California Congresswoman, Barbara Lee, who worked on Chisholm's 1972 presidential campaign, she was a student at the time, and she was shocked and really heartbroken by this goodwill gesture to George Wallace. And she considered just leaving the campaign altogether. And she asked Chisholm, how could you do that? And the answer that Chisholm gave her stays with Barbara Lee to this day as she tells the story. What did Chisholm say? She told the young Barbara Lee, we are all human beings. And you always have to be optimistic that people can change and that you can change and that one act of kindness makes all the difference in the world. Well, it made a difference to George Wallace. Maybe it could work for us. Thank you. Christina Hoff Summers' piece called Lessons of a Black Pioneer was published by Persuasion. To learn more about the community we're building at Persuasion and to get similar articles directly into your inbox, head to www.persuasion.community.
Today, I'm very happy to be joined by Jonah Goldberg. Jonah is one of the founders of The Dispatch, a conservative writer and intellectual who has been one of the leading voices criticizing Donald Trump from the very beginning. We had a conversation that was in part about the wisdom of impeachment, in part about the likely future of the Republican Party, and more broadly about the meaning of the terrible assault on the Capitol a little over a week ago, and how both it and Donald Trump is likely to be remembered through American history. I think if you're trying to grapple with how we will remember this pivotal moment in American history, this conversation will not answer any of your questions, but perhaps give you an interesting framework to think through. Jonah Goldberg, welcome to the podcast. It's great to be here. Big fan. Listen, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. We're recording this just under a week after the assault on the Capitol. And there's been a big debate, both about the nature of what happened and about what it implies for what we should do after. And I'd love to talk with you through some of those things, as, as well as many of the larger themes that evolved from your work and other things. How would you describe what happened last Wednesday? Was this a coup? Was it an insurrection? Was it an out of golpe? Was it simply a mob of people sort of attacking a building in confusion? Where in this span of different interpretations do you think we should put this? So I just wrote my LA Times column on this a little bit. I don't know whether it's worth debating whether it was an insurrection. Some of the nomenclature, I think, gets us sidetracked a little bit. But the way I think about it is that if you're a bank robber and you don't intend to use violence, maybe you don't even bring a gun, you just pretend to have a gun, but then a security guard has a heart attack or someone gets shot by the security guard and those contribute to your penalty. Like you're going to get a much harsher sentence if convicted. It's negligent homicide. If you brought a gun, you know, all these kinds of things, they're multiplier effect. My view is that what Donald Trump was trying to do was steal the election. And I think Fiona Hill's self-coup terminology is useful here because, again, you get these political scientists who say, well, the military wasn't involved, so it wasn't a coup. Fine. OK, but he was trying to steal an election. It's worth remembering that for four years, he never would answer with a straight face or with any clarity whether he would honor the results of an election. He wanted to keep his options open. On election night, before they could provide any evidence of systematic fraud or systemic fraud, he declared that he had won and that this was all illegitimate. He had said for weeks prior that if he were ahead on election night, he didn't want any more voting afterwards. And he had set up a system where he knew that he would most likely, if it was a close election, be ahead on election night because the absentee and early votes couldn't be counted until later. And then he systematically went through one strategy after another, trying to steal the election through various electoral college and legal plays. He was open and honest about, to the extent he can be, about how he wanted Amy Coney Barrett on the court because he thought it was going to go to the Supreme Court and he wanted her to rule in his favor. And he was nodding and winking about all of that. And he exhausted all of his options until the last one, which was this utterly bogus and contrived effort to get Mike Pence to do something that no constitutional scholar or historian has ever noticed in the powers of the vice president to steal the election. So to me, it's like the bank robber. Whether or not this crowd that parts of it turned into a mob and maybe there were some peaceful people and not everybody planned on being violent, that's all fine. But even if it had been entirely peaceful, what he was trying to do was use the executive branch to intimidate the legislative branch into committing an unconstitutional act and stealing an election. The violence makes it so much worse but even if it had been peaceful, I still think it would have been impeachable because it was an attempt to rob an election. Yeah, I mean, I've been thinking a lot about the concept of moral luck, which I actually oddly talked about in my dissertation as one of the few moments in my life when my dissertation has come in useful for anything. But it's really about the idea, which is related to what you're talking about, that if I have one drink too many and I drive home anyway, and you have one drink too many and you drive home anyway. And I happen to hit a child and kill a child, whereas you don't. Am I somehow morally more guilty than you? And on some interpretations of ethics, that seems absurd because we made the same irresponsible decision and it was just a matter of luck that the kid ran in front of my car rather than your car. 
but I think the outcome I'm responsible for is far worse. And since there was a negligent or morally bad act to begin with, that sort of puts me on the hook for what may result from it. And, you know, I think if I said, hey, you know what, so many people have one drink too many, uh, everybody does that sometimes, and I don't think I should feel any worse than the person who didn't kill a child, I think we'd say, well, there's something really wrong with your view of this. That's how I feel about some of the people in those protests. I'm sure there's some people who were there who perhaps didn't realize if they were at the back of a crowd to what extent it had been a violent takeover of a capital or who, you know, genuinely believed some of the lies about the election being stolen. Well, it so happens that they bumbled and stumbled into one of the most serious attacks on American democratic institutions. And that should be very relevant in what kind of punishment they get and how we deal with them. And the same way, you know, did Donald Trump intend for there to be a violent takeover of the Capitol? Perhaps, perhaps not. He certainly, as you were saying, courted that danger and that puts him morally on the hook for it. Now, what should the consequence be? You were talking about impeachment and I have a slightly split view of this. I think trying to impeach him after January 20th makes more sense than trying to impeach him before January 20th for various reasons. I think he absolutely fulfilled the substantive criteria to deserve to be impeached. If I was a, a senator asked to vote on impeachment articles, as long as the articles were sane and so on, I would vote to convict. I don't know, however, whether it's smart for Democrats to push impeachment right now, because I sort of feel that right now we have Trump exactly where we want him, which is to say that his party has turned on him more than it has at any other point. Only six senators went along with this preposterous idea of decertifying the results of the election or refusing to certify the results of the election. We are getting him out of office for the best possible reasons, which is a free and fair election in which 81 million Americans decided they don't want this guy in office. And he's looking for the first time in his life, not like a powerful winner, but like a sad, sore loser who, you know, can't abide by the fact that he lost, tries to pretend he won anyway, didn't get anywhere with that. That seems to me about as good a condition as we can have to get out of this Trumpist moment. And I worry that three more months of putting the spotlight on him through a Senate trial, potentially, and then at the end of that, an acquittal in which a lot of Republican senators run back into his arms is a big present to him. Am I wrong about this? I know I'm out of tune with everybody else on this. So I'm turning to my most conservative friend, Jonah Goldberg, <laughs> to, to finally persuade me why we should impeach Donald Trump. Okay, so... First of all, I want to go back to your very quickly your moral luck analogy about both of us driving with a couple of drinks in us. If we both have a couple of drinks and we go driving, we're both in some ways taking the same risks. And I get your point. But if one of us, if the bartender said, hey, man, you really should get a cab. And hey, by the way, there are a lot of kids around here and the, the roads are icy and it's dark. You got to be really careful. And they didn't say that to me. You'd be the worst actor because there was a greater foreseeability. Mm. There are lots of people who predicted that this might happen. There were lots of reasons to think it might happen. The president of the United States is the commander in chief. He's sworn to uphold the Constitution, maintain public order and all of these kinds of things. The fact that he was utterly unconcerned, it was sort of had a depraved indifference, I think, makes it a very different sort of equation. In terms of your point, look, I think you could be right, to be sure. You're making a prudential case against impeachment that. I think has merit and that reasonable people can hold or disagree with and all the rest. The reason why I disagree with you and where I disagree with a lot of the rhetoric from Democrats, the Democrats, I think that Nancy Pelosi behaved very badly with this nuclear code stuff. If she were truly interested in the nuclear codes issue, she wouldn't talk about how she was talking about the nuclear codes. Yeah, that drove me wild, I have to say. I mean, whether or not she really did have conversations with generals to make sure that if Trump is trying to launch a nuclear attack, they would actually slow walk it or, or, right. or, or simply refuse it. I'm not sure that she's the right person to have those conversations, but I also understand why she felt the need to. But if they have given you those assurances and your interest is actually in preventing Donald Trump from starting a war, don't go and talk about it. Yeah, exactly. Talk about it in 11 days. Don't talk about it now. It's, it's nuclear yeah. fight club. The first rule should be don't talk about nuclear fight club. So I'm not really particularly worried about that kind of thing. I think one very important case for acting with haste is if he is inclined to pardon the people who stormed the Capitol, that would be very, very bad. But mostly, I'm in favor of impeachment for two reasons. One is the sort of the patriotic civic hygiene argument. One of the remarkable things about Donald Trump is that despite his classic demagogue's attachment to his core followers and, and demagogic rhetoric and thinking and all this, he's actually very bad at using power. 
he didn't use the power that he had in ways that smart dictators could. And we should be kind of thankful about that. He wanted, as my friend Yuval Levin would put it, he wanted to use the presidency as a platform to perform upon rather than actually mm. exercise power in a serious way. What worries me in terms of the civic hygiene question is what happens when the next person comes down the pike who has the charismatic attachment to followers, but is actually smart about power? Right. And setting down an important precedent, I think, is valuable. Support for this podcast comes from Lexus. Maybe you're an aficionado, a fashionista, a foodie, or a sneakerhead. But no matter what you're into, it pays to go all in. Because the greater the obsession, the greater the reward. That's why Lexus went all in on the sports sedan by designing the new Lexus IS. It's the result of an unwavering obsession that left no detail spared. From a sleek, race-inspired design that's been fine-tuned down to the very last millimeter to one of the most sophisticated and connected automobile technology systems yet. The result is a sedan that looks as aggressive as it feels. The Lexus IS. All in on the sports sedan. Learn more at Lexus.com slash IS. I don't want to sort of get too head up in the impeachment question. I think it would be incredibly valuable to set that precedent. My worry is that we're not setting that precedent if it just results in a Senate acquittal. So the moment I think there's a realistic path towards getting 67 senators, I'm 100% in favor of impeachment. If all we do is, you know, be the parent who tells the child, if you do this, there's going to be terrible consequences but actually the child pushes the limits and the parent throws up the hands and says, well, I sort of tried to impose consequences, but I couldn't, it's not clear to me that that's pedagogically any better than not threatening the consequences. If we have a realistic path to 67 senators, sign me up. I get the argument from principle, but we have to enforce those norms. But it's not clear to me that a failed impeachment helps to strengthen or to undermine those norms. Yeah, I hear you. The second argument that I would make sounds partisan, but basically for the good of the GOP, because I think the country needs two healthy parties, and also for the punishment of the people who aided and abetted in this stuff, I very much think it'd be good for the country and the GOP in the long run to have a vote holding everybody accountable and putting everybody on the record, even if that led to an acquittal of Donald Trump. Because I think over time, the January 6th event is one of those strange events in our lives that gets worse over time rather than better. You know, mm. and I don't mean better, but, but like 9-11, the most horrific day about 9-11 was 9-11. I mean, watching it on TV, seeing people jump to their deaths, all that. Over time, you found out that weren't as many casualties as we thought there were going to be and all that. The January 6th event becomes more horrible as we go along. And I think that there are a lot of Republicans who understand that not being on the record against all of that is going to be bad for their legacy, going to be bad for their reputations, bad for their political futures. And forcing all of that onto the open, I think, has merit. But I, look, I hear you. I just think even forcing Republicans to vote against articles of impeachment has a clarifying point here. Mm, not, interesting. And so I hear what you're saying. I very much would not like to see Donald Trump acquitted. But my guess is, is that what would happen is that a lot of senators would vote in the same way that there was the only other impeachment trial that occurred after someone left office, this Belknap thing from the 19th century. The senators who voted to acquit did it on a technicality. They said bribery is really bad, but we can't do an impeachment after the guy's already left office. My guess right. is that would be the cowardly place a lot of Republicans would hide. Mm. And they would at least still be on the record saying this was no bueno. And I think that's sort of important. That's an interesting point. And the moment you said that, I thought that is what they're going to say, isn't it? I mean, there'll be a couple of Republican senators who were to impeach Mitt Romney and, you know, perhaps Murkowski and so on. And then there's obviously going to be a number of them who vote against impeachment. But I think you're right that the critical mass will vote against it on technical grounds right. like that. Let's talk a little bit about the future of a Republican Party, because that is important. I mean, I think we saw that the prospect of Democrats just achieving sort of complete victory was never realistic and is not going to happen. I think there was a lot of hope for that, that the four years of Donald Trump would sufficiently turn Americans, you know, against at least the present state of the Republican Party, that perhaps the Democrats would be able to have these big majorities and sort of remake the country. That clearly didn't happen. Very interestingly, also the 2020 election really undermined one of the main theories of how that might happen and come about, 
which is the idea of a rising demographic majority, that as there are more non-white voters who tend to vote in greater numbers for Democrats, Democrats would just sort of start piling up this huge advantage. The rapid movement of all kinds of minority groups, from Latinos um, to Muslims to actually some African-Americans for a smaller number, towards Trump and the Republican Party over the last four years seems to give a light to that. So I, as somebody on the center-left, am fully on board with the idea that we need a functioning center-right party in this country that is actually conservative, that actually stands up for constitutional values. I'm trying to be really optimistic these months and days <laughs> and think I'm out of step in my optimism, just as I was earlier out of step in my pessimism. But this is something that it's hard to see at the moment. If the Republican Party doesn't get back, what kind of independent party could take place that seems very unlikely because of the American electoral system? It's just whichever way you think through it, it's tempting to throw up your hand and say, there's just going to be a party that is in the mildest description tolerant of authoritarianism and that has a huge amount of power in our politics for the foreseeable future. Can you make me more optimistic about this? I'm not sure that I can. So I think that, I can't remember the political scientist, the sun and moon theory of parties. You know, the old argument was that you had one party that was dominant and the other party was the moon party, was illuminated by the light of the sun party. And they would take turns, you know, holding power. I think we basically have two moon parties now, two minority parties. I know that the sort of the standard liberal or left of center narrative about the Republican Party is that it's so enthralled to its donor base and it only does what big business and billionaires and kleptocrats want. When in reality, I think the problem with the Republican Party is that it's addicted to small donors and the stranglehold that right wing media and primaries have over the process. And I think we would be a better and healthier party if it actually was more in the command of CEOs and whatnot than of guys in tricorn hats, never mind Viking helmets. And I think the Democratic Party has similar, they're not exactly symmetrical problems, but right now both parties are essentially dominated by their bases. And I think that's in part because of the way the incentive structure of media is these days. And I think there's a lot more similarity in the political strategies of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Ted Cruz than either would like to admit. They're both very good at profiting from negative polarization. So here's the place where I think there actually is reason for hope. I never really thought about this much until Joe Manchin two months ago unilaterally told Brett Baer in an interview, hey, look, I'm not going to be the 50th vote for the Green New Deal or for getting rid of the legislative filibuster. And so all of this talk about how the Democrats are going to bring in communism and socialism and all of this kind of stuff, they're pointless because they're not going to get the votes necessary to be able to do all that. And in a moment, it made me realize how the Madisonian structure of our constitutional order, everyone talks about how it's set up to prevent an extremist despot or party that has the tyranny of the majority. It actually works really well by empowering people in the center when you have this sort of not quite tyranny, but the dominance of two minorities. So these bases have a huge amount of power over their parties, but the mere fact that everything is tied all of a sudden gives Manchin, Murkowski, Sass, Romney, some of whom are ideologically quite conservative, but they're reasonable people who are interested in actually governing a lot more power because they're the tiebreakers. And I think that that is a source for optimism. I also think the fact that Joe Biden is actually... I got huge problems with Joe Biden, but but he actually is interested in leeching some of the poison out of the system. And he thinks that would be his legacy. And that's a good legacy to have. So I'm somewhat optimistic on that front. But long term, I think the stranglehold of a media complex that monetizes dopamine hits, a media complex that thinks its job is to tell its audiences what it wants to hear rather than what they need to hear, and a primary system that allows the most extreme parts of both parties to dominate, which would be bad under normal circumstances, but in an era of the big sort and gerrymandering and all these other things, it, it multiplies that problem even more so. I'll just be flatly honest about that. You know, I'm a conservative. I want the deciding voters in America, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, to basically be bourgeois people. Families with sort of, you can be pro-choice or pro-life, you can be, you know, pro-gun, anti-gun, all these kinds of things, those are arguments to have at the margins. But at the end of the day, I want them to be sort of people with relatively traditional values 
who believe in delayed gratification, living within your means. I want it to be multi-ethnic, middle class. I want those people to be the people who are the deciding voters in American politics. And the way we're structured now is to not make that the case. And that's what I want to get back to. That's really, really interesting. And we could dive deeper into some of the structural questions. But I think there's also a big ideological question that I'd be particularly interested to hear your opinion about, which is when you look at the pre-Trump Republican Party, I do think that there's a fair case to be made that it had gotten out of touch with a lot of its voter base. That at that point, a lot of its ideological program was driven by very affluent people, by some ideological libertarians, by big business in certain ways. And that actually over time, its social basis had become really sort of working class, a lot of white, but not just white, working class people, a lot of people who didn't feel part of the elite. In fact, they felt intensely resentful of the elite. Now, Donald Trump used that opening for his kind of politics. And if there's one thing that you and I very strongly agree on, it's that that is not the path that either the Democratic or the Republican Party should follow. And that's been incredibly destructive of our institutions over the last four years. But what kind of ideological profile can the Republican Party take on that doesn't fall into the trap that had hollowed it out to some extent until about four years ago? And you might, of course, disagree with that interpretation that gives it life in a different way, that can actually make it speak, not to exactly the coalition it now has, but to some extent to that coalition, right? That can make it actually speak to the needs and desires of working class people across the country who feel pretty shut out of our institutions otherwise, but without having that deeply illiberal authoritarian and to some extent racist tint that it has taken on over the last four years. I mean, what does that new ideology look like? Or do you think I'm being unfair to the ideology quo ante, the ideological kind of direction of the Republican Party four years ago? Okay, so I think you're being a little unfair, but defensively unfair. <laughs> um, and I'm not trying to do a both sidesism thing because I think Trump is a uniquely pernicious figure in our lifetimes. But I wish the Democratic Party could do more soul searching about why the white working class, non-college educated whites, which were the spine of the FDR coalition, the Democratic coalition for 60 years, why are they fleeing the Democratic Party and going to the Republican Party? It takes two to tango. And because a lot of these people are joining the Republican Party and a lot of these people are fleeing the Democratic Party. And there should be more introspection among Democrats than there's been some. I'm not saying there hasn't, but I think that's in a part of the equation that you got to keep in mind. Unless you want to say the Democratic Party was perfectly fine with having, you know, people that Democrats now call racists in their party up until 2016 or up until 2012. And the second they vote for Donald Trump, they are now evil and they're glad to be rid of them. I mean, if that's the argument, that's really problematic. I mean, personally, just to speak to that, I do think that this is where a huge role is played by this idea of an inevitable demographic majority for Democrats. Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of Democratic strategists just thought, we don't need those people. And I think they exaggerated the extent to which those people aren't winnable on grounds of principle. And it's clearly true of some of the base of Donald Trump, without a doubt. But I think they generalized and said, you know, the white working class they're just all bigots and they're just bad people and we're never going to win them over. And what's more, we don't need to win them over. And so let's just run up the numbers on urban professionals with college degrees and ethnic minorities and religious minorities and so on. And if you go back to something like the episode of this podcast with Ruth Sarah, for example, that's just arithmetically wrong. And it's going to continue to be arithmetically wrong for a very long time, even if it wasn't the case that a lot of those groups now appear to be moving uh, towards the Republican camp, which is fascinating in itself. So I do think that that's a part of the explanation, at least. And I just want to add something to that, and Rui is not guilty of this, but a lot of influencers, a lot of activists who bought into the demography is destiny stuff that Rui and John Judas and other people put forward, back when it seemed more plausible, to be fair to them, right? They took from that, not only do we not need to work to hold on to these people, but they also put out rhetoric and ideas that chase these people out of the coalition. When you say, when you're really celebratory about how it's great, we're almost at the point where white people are a minority in this country and it's our turn and all that kind of stuff. How do you expect even non-racist white people to 
respond to some of that rhetoric. So anyway, I didn't mean to hijack this into a let's bash on the Democrats thing. The only other point, which is familiar to people who listen to my podcast, I would make about the ideology quo ante point is that one of my great frustrations is there were people for 10 years before the rise of Donald Trump, Ross Douthat and Ryan Salam, my friend Ramesh Panuru, Yuval Levin, Michael Strain, lots of my colleagues at the American Enterprise Institute, some of my colleagues when I was back at National Review, who you know, went broadly by the label reformicons. And I didn't agree with them on everything, but I agreed with them on a lot. And their basic argument, as Ramesh would put it, was you want to take Reaganite principles and update them for the current problems, right? And so just constantly playing the Wall Street Journal card of always focusing on lowering top marginal income tax rates, which is sort of the ideology that you're talking about. First of all, misses as a pragmatic matter that most of the benefits we would get from lowering that from 72 to 35 have already been achieved. And second of all, maybe we want to think about a payroll tax cut or doing something to help working class people and working class families, those bourgeois families and want to be bourgeois families that I was talking about. And the response from the priests of conservatism to a large extent was you squish rhinos, you deviationists. The Wall Street Journal's position was if it's not from the 1982 Reagan tax program, then it's creeping socialism. People like Mark Levin and some of those guys were like, they're just pissing on the legacy of Reagan. They're really, you know, Democrats in Republican clothing, yada, yada, yada. And then along comes Donald Trump and he starts winning over the white working class with vitriol and hatred and bigotry and nativism. And many of the same people are now telling me, oh, no, you have to get on board the Trump train because he's the only guy who can attract the white working class. And my frustration is, well, maybe if we had listened to Ross and Raihan and some of these other people and you've all about doing these practical policy issues that would help the white working class and the working class generally, because it drives me crazy people talk about the working class as if it's just white people, which it's not. If the Republican Party had worked harder at actually breaking with its dogma on some of this stuff sooner, maybe you could have attracted these people for the right reasons, made them feel less isolated, less unheard, and less prone to resorting to extremist populism because the government was actually solving some of the problems in their lives. And so it's this hypocrisy of, on the one hand, condemning these efforts when they could have worked to fend off some of these problems, and then claiming that the reason why you have to get on board now is because Donald Trump is attracting these people for all the wrong reasons. It's a deep frustration of mine. There was a lot of ideological spade work being done among conservatives to head off a lot of these problems, and the media industrial complex of conservatism didn't want to hear it. That sounds very convincing to me, and it's an interesting question. What would have happened, for example, in the 2012 post-motum within the Republican Party, which basically said the Republican Party needs to become more multi-ethnic, it needs to find a different way of speaking to some of the working class voters and so on, would have been heeded instead of what we saw, which is the 2016 Donald Trump run. You know, I'm, I'm going to try off a cuff to do a kind of categorization of different ways in which Trump challenge the pre-existing Republican ideological consensus. And I guess I'd be interested in hearing from you what of that was actually electorally appealing and what was, that was unappealing, and not necessarily the same question, what of that a post-Trump Republican Party should keep on board and what of it it should take away, right? So I think the first is a kind of nearly European-style ethno-nationalism. Right. I mean, the part of Trump that justifiably gets him associated with white nationalism and so on. I mean, I think I personally have a strong view that that was not what made him electorally appealing. And certainly I'm sure that we both have the strong normative view that that is not where the Republican Party should be going. The second, which is a kind of different thing, I think, is an opposition to wokeness, an opposition to certain of the main sort of cultural progressive causes of parts of the left. You know, you can think of the sort of ideal type of that, something like Boris Johnson, right, who I disagree with on plenty of things, but who certainly cannot be accused of being racist or inflammatory in the kind of way that Donald Trump is. So that's a sort of second strand of that. A third strand that was never really realized in Trump's policies, but that he did talk about quite a lot in 2016 and that some people like Tom Cotton seem to be trying to run with, is a kind of economic populism. Right, saying, look, like we are actually going to do the big splashy things that are going to help average people. Perhaps we should give Medicare to 
a lot younger people. Perhaps actually the state is responsible for universal health care in some kind of way, as Trump seemed to imply in 2016. Perhaps we should give $2,000 checks to people, that kind of stuff. So the kind of economic, I don't like to use the word populism in that context, because for me populism means something different, but a sort of robustly left-wing economic policy that actually is designed to help working class people. Then the fourth, I think, is, again, a sort of extreme isolationism that actually prefers autocrats around the world to Democrats. Again, I think it's very clear that that shouldn't be part of it. A fifth is something that probably has more resonance in the public, which is a sort of soft isolationism, where you're not torpedoing NATO, you're not buddying up to the North Korean dictator while telling people that the German chancellor is terrible. But you are saying, you know what, actually the state should do a lot less in foreign policy and we're really not the world policeman. Let's pull back a little bit and there's nothing that we gain from trying to uphold, you know, the least well-branded term in the world, which is the liberal international order or something like that. So those are sort of five broad elements. Mm -hmm. You know, are there any of those that the Republican Party should keep on? And if so, what might that party look like going forward? I am not sure you're going to like my answer. Good. All the better. Yeah. So I want to start by rejecting the entire premise of it. (laughs) Um, I'm not saying that those five elements aren't part of Trump or Trumpism or the Trump record or whatever. That's all fine. You know, we could probably come up with three more, you know, whatever, but deregulatory stuff, you know, and all that. But my fundamental problem, and this is something I've been banging my spoon on my high chair about for four and a half, five years. I just don't think Trumpism is an ideological phenomenon. I think it is a psychological phenomenon. I think it is a psychological phenomenon that starts with his own psychology, his robust narcissism, his instinctual approach to all questions, which is that he doesn't care about actual public policy. He just cares about winning and prestige and face and all that kind of stuff. And also the psychological phenomenon of the attachment that his biggest fans have to him. I find the project of Hawley, Rubio, and a lot of these guys for the economic nationalism part that you were talking about, for whatever the right term for it is, to be almost laughable. Because the assumption that they are working from, and they say so in speeches, and they create all these straw men about how you know, libertarians have been running Washington for 30 years and all these kinds of things, which always makes my libertarian Mm. friends laugh. They think that the attachment to Trump from certainly his most ardent fans, but even more generally, was primarily policy-driven. And there's no Mm. evidence for it. First of all, most of his policy victories are zombie Reaganism stuff that I believe in, right? It's like the Federalist Society judges, the tax cuts that Paul Ryan engineered. I mean, you go down a list, it's there's very little of the sort of America first stuff except on trade. And I would argue that the vast, vast majority of Trump supporters like the trade stuff less because they are serious students of Friedrich List or rejectors of Adam Smith or anything, and more because they see trade as a culture war issue. Right, somebody standing up for America and yeah. against China and, you know, finally somebody is, is... Sure. Look, I don't disagree with any of that argument. I certainly don't mean to say that Trump had those five categories in mind or that he would be capable of formulating them or that his administration pursued them in any kind of coherent fashion. Even the worst parts of those five things the administration, thankfully, didn't pursue in incoherent fashion because it didn't pursue anything in coherent fashion. But I guess it does still seem to me like there's a reason why those five kind of elements attached themselves to Trumpism. And when you're thinking through how a viable conservative party, right of center party in the United States might coalesce that rejects Trumpism and yet has real electoral appeal, you know, you don't want to go for cloning Trump's psychological appeal by some other figure right? So it's got to be on policy. And perhaps that's a losing fight, right? Mm-hmm. Perhaps that's an, yet another reason to be pessimistic about the possibility of having a non-authoritarian or even just a non-Trump Republican Party going forward. But it seems to me like the best path if you are interested in recreating the party. So look, I'm not in the business of giving advice to the Republican Party because I'm left of center. But if I were in the business of it, here's roughly what I would say. And so since this is not what I'm good at, you can shred me to pieces in a minute. And I like your answer again, even (laughs) though you'll disagree with me. No, it seems to me that an idealized version of something like Boris Johnson would be the way to do it, right? I think you get rid of the Afro-nationalist stuff. You don't want people to be scared of you or to hate you with that intensity. And of course, that's not the party that I would hope emerges. 
But I think you do basically say, look, for all of the flaws in American history and so on, America is basically great. And, you know, to an extent that I wouldn't quite agree with, but you sort of engage in a more radical, but not a more extremist form of rejection of the woke wins than even me or persuasion would be engaged in. So that would be one element, I think. Then I think on economic policy, you know, you don't go against capitalism, you don't go even against free trade exactly, but you do say, hey, you know, we actually have very real programs that improve the lives of a working class and that do in some important ways break with Reaganism. And I think that probably would go beyond the sort of technocratic stuff that the reformicons came up with, a lot of which I do agree with. I mean, you know, really go all in on the earned income tax credit or whatever. I think it probably would go to some visible anti-trade stuff or some visible, you know, buy American stuff, which actually Joe Biden also has, which I'm somewhat skeptical of, right? So it would go a little bit further in that direction. And then probably on foreign policy, again, it would absolutely say our friends are, you know, Germany and France and Japan, and there's no question about that, and we're not calling that in doubt. But you know what? We're really not going to be very engaged in the world. Again, that's not my personal preference. I think the United States has a role to play for defending democracy around the world. But that seems to me where the American public is. And I think if the Republican Party ran on that, that seems to me the most realistic way for them to win. And it may be a way of keeping off the authoritarian elements within the party. I may be entirely wrong about that. So tell me why I'm wrong about that and what hope of any there is for a Republican Party to emerge that's not Trumpified in the absence of that. Yeah. So again, I apologize for not being as cooperative as you want me to be, but there's an important clarification here that I just feel like I need to make. I've never really given a rat's ass about calling myself a Republican. And one of my deep convictions about the problems with the conservative movement, however you want to define it, is that vast swaths of it have internalized the idea that their job is to be political consultants to figure out how Republicans can win. Mm. And that is inherently corrupting. It has corrupted large swaths of people who I thought had the same job description as me. But, you know, look, I'm also a pundit. And so I'm, I'm happy to sort of have this kind of conversation about what would be good for the Republicans, because that's like my day job. But at the end of the day, I think it's really, really important for conservatives who care about conservatism and think that conservatism is a patriotic approach to preserving what is best about this country. You know, as my friend Yuval says, you know, conservatism should be understood as gratitude. I would rather advocate for the principles that I actually hold near and dear to my heart even if they are unpopular in the Republican Party. And so, yeah, I think moving a little bit more towards sort of a social democratic approach could actually help Republicans because the nature of their coalition is changing. Just as I think the Democrats should move off a lot of the woke stuff because you have suburbanites moving in to their coalition and they're put off by some of that stuff. So, you know, the job of the Republican and the Democratic Party is to win elections with a basic, somewhat recognizably coherent, philosophically coherent platform. The job of conservative, I don't want to sound grandiose and conservative intellectual, just conservative writers, is a little different. And that is to hold politicians in general, but the Republican Party in particular, accountable to certain principles that we are supposed to believe in even when they're unpopular. And I think that one of the things a lot of conservative Republicans have forgot during the ideological period that you were talking about before, pre-2016, is that libertarian economics are not particularly popular in this country. And for me, that's not an argument for abandoning libertarian economics. It's an argument for coming up with better arguments for libertarian economics to persuade people to them. So in terms of your actual question, I think the GOP... I don't think it's going to buy into the ethno-nationalism stuff. There are fringe people who were definitely in for it, you know, Steve King types, but they're still very much at the margins. The trade stuff is going to be complicated because I think we are entering an era where everybody is going to be a hawk on China. The only dividing line is who's going to be dumb about it and who's going to be smart about it. But also at the end of the day, one of the things that I learned from the horrors of watching the sort of invasion of body snatchers thing claim so many of my friends who were adamantly anti-Trump and then flipped a switch and went pro-Trump, is that personality and group dynamics and the herd mentality stuff is just very, very, very strong. And if some other politician is just popular, you know, for whatever reason, you know, people like Nikki Haley's wardrobe or 
They want a virtue signal that they're not racist. So they like Tim Scott, whatever the reasons are. You know, I'm fairly soft on Tim Scott and, and Nikki Haley. But my point is that that is probably going to be more determinative than any policy stuff. I mean, I'm just very depressed about the degree to which policy really hasn't mattered among conservatives or among Republicans over the last four years. It's been almost all cult of personality stuff as the tipping point issue. Yeah, I mean, I think I agree that actually we probably overlearned the lessons of a 2016 Republican primary in thinking that this really helps to explain completely sort of where the American public is at or even where right of center America is at. And I think we're in the same way, it's easy to try and think that the 2024 Republican primary will depend on these fundamental questions when it really depends on sort of who happens to be a compelling candidate for relatively random reasons. Do they have a lane for themselves versus other people who really interfere with each other? And the lanes are not ideological. They're kind of much more complicated and so on. So, so I agree with all of that. Well, let me, however, push you in your role as pundit in the other direction, which is to say, you know, the reason why I am worried about some of the strategic things, and I think what you said is actually a very important lesson. Um, you know, you have to tell it straight and you have to talk about the world as you actually believe in it. And if you start to think of yourself as a kind of consultant to a political party, you cannot do the honest work of a writer and a public intellectual. And I think that's something that I try to hold myself to, and the world would be better if more people held themselves to in general. Um, of course, that is hard when you do believe that the stakes of politics are existential. So during the Trump era, I found myself sometimes taking on that kind of strategic role because I really care about beating Donald Trump. Sure. And when it comes to something like impeachment, you know, it would have been much easier for me, it would have been the easier role for me to play to say, well, I think he deserves to be impeached, so let's just go through with impeachment. It's not my job to think about what the consequences might be, but because I really care about uh, making sure that Donald Trump doesn't have a layup to come back in 2024 and become president again, I sort of knowingly took a stance that I knew was going to be unpopular among many of my friends and followers and so on. But if I can press you into the service of a pundit for two more minutes, what do you think Joe Biden needs to do for his presidency to be a success? What do you think the incoming administration needs to do to hopefully do some good things for the country and to you know, hold off a Republican challenge, especially if it turns out to be Donald Trump 2.0, especially if it turns out to be Trump himself or a member of his family or some close ally running against Biden in 2024? Yeah, I think it is incandescently obvious that the smartest, best thing in his political interest, which would also be the best thing for the country, is to emulate as best as conceivably possible Israel's success in vaccinating this country and getting us out of the COVID thing. I think the pandemic has made people crazier than they already were with Donald Trump in everybody's heads. It was sort of a perfect storm, you know, locking people away. And if you could have a return to normalcy, you know, I like the 1920s return to normalcy, but just a return to normalcy as a generic concept, I think that would very much be in Joe Biden's interest. I think if you gave Joe Biden truth serum and asked him whether or not he was happy that they won both seats in Georgia, I'm not sure you wouldn't get a complicated answer because if he had to work with Mitch McConnell, and I know a lot of your listeners don't like Mitch McConnell, but he would have been able to say to the base of the party, look, I just I just can't do it. You know, I got to this has to get through the Republicans. And it would have allowed him to focus on centrist stuff a lot more. And I understand the argument. The Democratic Party has the same issue with the same argument that the Republican Party has, which is that everything's a base election now. And if you just gin up your own side, you don't have to worry about fighting for the center anymore. I want to live in a country where you still have to fight for the center. I think that makes us a better country. And that means fewer conservative victories crammed through, but also means fewer left-wing victories crammed through. It's a very Disraelian kind of muddling through kind of approach to politics, which I prefer. And so I think that Biden, some of the things he's done have been pretty good. I think it'd be smart to have somebody around him reminding him that the African-American vote that got him elected was older, more middle-class, more moderate. African-American vote in terms of at least getting him the primary nominate, you know, the nomination in the primaries. And I think a little of his woke stuff goes a really long way. I mean, he doesn't need to play those games right now. But again, I think the pandemic part of it is so central. If he can just simply get people out of their homes and getting back to their lives, because one of my central arguments, which I made in my book, was that 
one of the reasons why our politics sucks so much is that people are following politics as if it's a form of entertainment. And weird things happen to your brain when you follow things as forms of entertainment. It then becomes good versus evil, heroes versus villains and whatnot. But if you're stuck at home following politics solely through screens, that's how you're going to view everything. And if we could get people out and about, that would be very healthy. Other than that, staying out of people's living rooms, you know, people like Joe Biden a lot more in theory than they like him in person, I think. And I think they do like him in person generally, even though most conservatives don't think he's a bad guy. I mean, they're idiots who think he's, of course, a Manchurian candidate, pawn of China and all that kind of stuff. But I think slow and steady, you know, except on the pandemic stuff, probably wins the race for him. You said early on in our conversation, which I thought was really interesting, that January 6th gets worse by the day. We keep finding out how close we were to an even worse disaster, how close we were to congressmen and senators getting harmed and hurt. And so in a way, sort of as it sinks in. Or even the vice president hung, you know, I mean, that's not nothing. Right. You know? <laughs> okay, God. Um, how do you think we'll remember this day? Do you think we'll remember it as an augury of worse things to come? Or do you think it will be remembered as the moment when the fever broke? I would be much happier to answer that question after the inauguration. I think there are real concerns about safety on the inauguration, and maybe the planning will head that off. And so this will be remembered more as uh, fever breaking than inaugury. But I think if there's real violence on the 20th, then we know that this was you know, foreshadowing. I think if America is going to get back to being a somewhat healthy country politically, January 6th will in the long run be remembered as one of our more shameful moments in post-slavery or post-Jim Crow America. It was just a fundamentally indefensible horror. And once you get past the political generation of politicians who are complicit in it, it will be remembered as such, as I, I, I suspect, by Republicans and Democrats alike. But right now, you just have too many Republicans who shamefully went along with this, that gave this thing oxygen for them to be forthright and come out and say so. And that's the test for me. You know, we were talking about impeachment, and I understand there are arguments pro and con. The Republicans who say you can't do this impeachment because there isn't enough time on the calendar. To me, that's a nearest weapon to hand argument. I don't think they necessarily believe it. And there are real problems if you do believe it, because that means presidents can run out the clock and do all sorts of evil things towards the ends of their presidencies, and there is no formal sanction by government for it. But the people who claim to believe that and other things sincerely, the counterposition then is, and that's why we should censure him. That's why we should do X to be on the record to say this was unacceptable. But instead what they're doing, which I think is a profoundly cowardly whataboutism BS, is they're saying, look, Joe Biden said he wants to unify the country. Uh, you know, let's, let's give him that opportunity. It's such BS, right? They should be out yeah. there. <laughs> And all these people who are saying, including, you know, colleagues of mine at Fox News and all these other places who say, you have to understand the 75 million people who feel that they're being called insurrectionists and they're being tarred with guilt by association. Well, you know what you do if you are a law-abiding, decent conservative who doesn't believe in what these guys did is you condemn it. That's how you show the world that you are not associated with it. Instead, the argument is you can't make this into a big deal because it makes these right-wing snowflakes feel like victims. Screw that. The Republican Party should have some courage and go forth. And as Ben Sass said, this was wicked. Say it was wicked. And you're giving this historical opportunity to lay it all on Donald Trump, who's no longer in power. Use him as a scapegoat, right? Say he threatened you or that you felt that you couldn't cross him or whatever, whatever cowardly BS you want to offer, but be on record condemning this. Instead, Republicans want to play these really dumb I think as a pundit and also as a conservative and as an American, just really dumb games to get out of feeling accountable or being held accountable for any of this. They lied to the American people continually for three months or however long it was since the election, saying that the election was stolen, it was a lie, and then they don't want you to criticize people who believe the lies. That's Matt Gates, who's a moron. Um, that's his position, is that you have to understand these people are offended when you say they're believing in a conspiracy theory. Well, mm. that is the way democracies die, is when belief in a conspiracy theory becomes a part of unimpeachable identity politics. 
Where you're right. like, that's just right. my faith structures. I believe that the friggin' <laughs> North Koreans and the Venezuelans stole this election for the Democrats. If that becomes an identity politics kind of thing that it's offensive to question, then, you know, I'm, I'm heading to New Zealand because that's nuts. Well, this was a great finale to the conversation. I have one observation about January 6th and one small and surprising way in which I'm grateful to it. And that is that I think January 6th, whether it's going to be remembered as an augury of worse things to come or as the moment the fever broke, has secured Donald Trump's place in history. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is that for a long time, I had the fear that the, the further away you get from political figures, the more you see them as entertaining rather than having real political and normative stakes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we look back at past American presidents, you know, what we remember about them is not the policy or what they actually stood for. That's true of a few people like Abraham Lincoln. But often we just, you know, like Teddy Roosevelt, who, you know, wrestled with a bear and so on. And I always had this... JFK is the greatest example of that, right? It is just yeah, pure exactly. style over substance. And I was really afraid that people might look back at Donald Trump and think, you know, isn't he a great American figure? You know, just in sort of cinematographic terms, mm -hmm. you know, like he's so larger than life, he's so weird. And then all of his attacks on democracy, all the things that made him so dangerous are difficult to explain, right? I mean, go into an elementary school classroom 50 years from now and explain, you know, all the things that Trump did that were bad in terms that actually are communicable, that don't rely on a deep understanding of a bunch of political norms that are, you know, difficult to keep in your mind. And so I was actually worried about how Trump might be remembered. I think that January 6th has lastingly changed that because the pictures, I mean, the astonishing pictures from that day and the fact that, you know, he is an American president who would not accept the outcome of the election and he incited these people and they end up breaking into the Capitol. And here are some striking pictures from that. You can explain that from an 80 year old in 2050. And I think that has secured Donald Trump's rightful place in American history as one of and perhaps the most anti-democratic presidents we've had, one of the presidents who have most attacked the basic rules of our republic. There are others who may have been worse in other ways, but the worst in this particular respect, I think January 6th has secured his place in history for that and for obviously would have chosen for it not to happen. I am in a strange way grateful for that little thing. I agree. It's a silver lining. I agree. I think that's a very important point. I mean, think about it this way. If Oliver Stone had made some sort of like once upon a time in Hollywood alternative fantasy thing about American politics in which the climactic scene had a mob that was beating a police officer with American flag poles <laughs> right. so they could get into the Capitol to hang the vice president of the United States and take prisoner the speaker of the house. Um, you would say, gosh, you know, that stone, he just hates America. Like, why is he, why does he peddle this kind of garbage? But that's actually literally what happened. And I've been grateful to this because I, I think this gets to the point we were making at the beginning is that he doesn't know how to use power. If Donald Trump had mm. graciously, while still holding open the idea that it was stolen, right? He could still have that talking point so he could save face. But if he had graciously, you know, conceded shortly after the election, I think he'd be in very good shape to run in 2024. They stole it from us. We're going to get it back. That way he would have left on a high note for his party. But instead, by behaving like literally, I mean, I, I've been asking historians, is there a greater, is there a competing example of a greater sore loser in American history? And, you know, with maybe the exception of Aaron Burr, it's very difficult to find anybody who comes even remotely close. And I think that's useful. It's also useful for people like me. I think this is a very cheap emotion, which I try to keep in check. But there is a certain amount of I told you so schadenfreude of just being able to say, look, I've been saying for four years, this is going to end in tears. This guy is unfit for office. He's proving everything I said about him more or less correct in how he's handling this. That's very useful for me in the wars to come about the future of conservatism and the Republican Party. Again, if he had left on a grace note, it would have been much harder for me to be able to have standing in some of those arguments. Jonah Goldbock, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Great to be here. Keep up the great work. Persuasion is fantastic. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much for listening to The Good Fight. Lots of listeners have been spreading the word about the show. If you too have been enjoying the podcast, please be like, rate the show on iTunes, tell your friends all about it, share it on Facebook or Twitter. And finally, please mail suggestions for great guests or comments about the show to goodfightpod at gmail.com. That's goodfightpod at gmail.com. This recording carries a Creative Commons 4.0 international license. Thanks to Silent Partner for their song, Chess Pieces. Thank you.